Hey, what's going on YouTube? It's Pyromancer here and welcome back to my channel. Hope you're all having a wonderful day, morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are in the world. And today, I have to show you guys something. This is something that I've been wanting to talk about for a very long time and I am very, very excited. So hope you guys enjoy today's video. Today I want to talk to you guys about Sargeras, shocking, and Nizoth, and Argus the Unmaker, because there is some there's something that I need to show you that I think the pictures just speak for themselves. So I'm just going to put them on the screen. I'm just going to put it on the screen right now. And what you're seeing here is some images of Sargeras and his sword, which we are at this point very familiar with. And there's something that's very particular about this sword that I want you to notice. And that, of course, is the eye that exists in the hilt or not the hilt, pardon me, in the handguard of his blade. There is an eye, uh, and it seems to be like a burning eye, but it almost looks like an old god eye at the same time. Well, this image, which I'm also going to show you, is the eye of Nazoth from the Unat scenario in the Crucible of Storms. And they look exactly the same. So then people may ask, well, wait a second, did Sargeras have an eye of Nazoth in his blade? Uh, well, if we were to go on what's canon lore, no, that's, that's not what that would be. We actually have no explanation for what that is. Back in the RPG lore, it was established that Sargeras had a sword called Gorshalak, which was semi-sentient to a degree. And there are even nods to the existence of this blade in the game, like the Gorshalak's legacy trinket from Antorus the Burning Throne in Legion. But when we actually get to witness the blade in the game, it has a very different appearance. We can see that it has this red and black energy that is flowing out of it, energy that I believe is death energy. And when we use our artifact weapons to pull said energy out of the blade, what remains, very briefly, is, a, is like a burning a burning orange, I don't know what it is, but it's flame, and it seems that it was actually being concealed by the shadow on the outside. So then you may ask, well, what was that red and black shadow? And I've pointed this out probably a dozen times in the past before, but I believe that that red and black energy from Sargeras' sword was from Argus the Unmaker. And I actually believe, if you've watched my Blood of Two Titans video, which you should definitely watch, there'll be a link to that down in the description, I believe that Argus the Unmaker was actually being housed in some capacity within that sword. It is known, this is canon lore, that Sargeras and Argus were actually linked together. This is something that Magni tells us when we're traversing Antorus the Burning Throne, that there is a connection between the two. And in order to sever that connection, we've got to take Argus to the Titan's place of power, the seat of the Pantheon. And we take them there, take Argus there. The Titans perform some kind of weird little siphoning onto Argus. Uh, and then Sargeras commands Argus to rise. Rise, Argus. Rise, my broken world. And Argus stands up. Obviously luminously golden and red and then he fades to a blue and golden form which we fight but in the mythic version when presumably sargeras re-establishes a connection with argus argus turns back to the red and black version we can assert that he has re-established th this connection because you begin to deal with certain mechanics like sentence of sargeras which is awfully paladin-esque if you were to ask me uh you start dealing with Sargeras's fear, Sargeras's rage. And I've pointed out before, it's very interesting that these forces manifested uh, in the fight because these, this fear and this rage is supposed to be for the said Void Lords that wanted to corrupt the Sleeping Titan. But the point is, is that Sargeras turns to this black and red, and it is the exact same color scheme and to an extent the even, even the same texture as what we witness in Sargeras's sword. It just so happens that after Sargeras plunges his sword back into the world, or into the world for the first time, rather, that we see Azerite popping up, which is gold and blue. 
I have proposed in the past that this is not just the blood of Azeroth, but also the blood of Argus, and that it is light and shadow, creation and destruction, not light and void, that bullshit, holy light and void fuckery, which is a, basically just a mimic of these real forces. Azeroth, creation, what I believe, Argus, destruction, the end. And they are meant to be together as one. That is what I believe. The only other time Azerite has ever been present in the game, as far as we know, happened right after, you guessed it, Deathwing broke through the mantle and shattered the boundary between the elemental plane of Earth and Azeroth. Deathwing is another gigantic hint in this situation because don't you think Deathwing's aesthetic is remarkably similar to Sargeras? Hmm. On that note, Deathwing was a black dragon, and it just so happens that on Sargeras's armor, at least his old depictions of his armor, all of them except the one we actually see in the game, actually had a black dragon skull on his right pauldron. And it is definitely a black dragon skull. Looks just like Nefarian, or even Onyxia. But Deathwing is a very interesting one, because Deathwing gave himself to the deep places. He gave himself to Nazoth. Because he was inherently tied to the earth, Nazoth had no trouble corrupting Deathwing. Corrupting him. Deathwing chose to listen, and thus followed the path which was laid out before him. But don't you think, for Neltharion to be corrupted by Nazoth and then become... Deathwing is kind of ironic, considering that aesthetically he looks incredibly similar to Sargeras. It's probably also a coincidence that in the, uh, I believe it's the Wrath of the Dragon Queen quest line from Cataclysm, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, uh, but Deathwing actually, to Alexstrasza, the life binder, refers to himself as Death Incarnate, the unmaker of worlds. Well, hold, hold on a second here, because because the Unmaker is Argus, the Titan of Death, the Unmaker. That's that's kind of weird. Well, 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 wait a second. In order for Deathwing to be pumped with such an incredible amount of power, part of the reason why he was being housed in Deep Home and having plates literally bolted onto his body is because the power inside of him that was being pumped into him by Nazoth caused him to be incredibly unstable and literally begin to fall apart. Yeah, nice dialogue that he had in that cinematic, by the way. Go, go ahead and give, give a listen to what Deathwing says right here, and tell me if this sounds at all familiar to what Argus the Unmaker says. Like, really? Azeroth will break. 
I mean, seriously, pain, agony. <laughs> the whole world will burn beneath the shadow of my wing. The world heaves with my torment. My rage. <laughs> when you fight Argus the Unmaker, he even has abilities where the fight triggers dialogue. Like, it's fight-based dialogue that says, The rage of the Unmaker surges. Like, it was dialogue that never made it into the game, but still, like... Are you fucking serious? Come on, dude! But that power that we're seeing, god damn, does that look like something that would come from Sargeras, don't you think? I mean, let's be honest here, guys. Who is the most powerful being? Who is the single most just powerful thing that we've ever seen in World of Warcraft? I don't think there's that much to argue here. It's definitely Sargeras. And while we were all, because of Chronicle, expecting Sargeras to be fell green, he was not. Sargeras burns with brilliant radiance, and he is certainly not fell, another thing that Chronicle is wrong about, but that's probably also a coincidence. What I am saying is that I believe that Deathwing was not necessarily receiving his power directly from Nazoth, which is possible, but that Deathwing may have actually done some of the things that he did because of the influence of Sargeras. Think about this. Nazoth got Deathwing to make the demon soul into the dragon soul, which was then used in a ritual to try to summon Sargeras through the Well of Eternity into Azeroth. Nazoth wanted this to happen. There is plenty of evidence that Nazoth is actually working with Sargeras. As I pointed out in my last video, the portfolio for Xavius from Legion it describes in his nightmare satyr form, which was given to him by Sargeras, by the way, he was the first satyr crafted by the hand of Sargeras, he was actually pursuing his conquest of Val Shirah in the name of the Burning Legion. The nightmare and what it stands for and what is fueling it is allied with the forces of the Burning Legion. You can literally go to the Temple of Elune in Val Shirah and see that the commander of the Legion, a giant Doom Lord, is working with the Nightmare. And people, for some reason, try to pawn this off as, oh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, or whatever this bullshit is. But no. According to Chronicle, the whole reason Sargeras started the Crusade was because he was concerned what the plot from the Void Lords and their involvement with the Old Gods would cause to creation, what that was going to do to creation. So, another link between Sargeras and Nazoth is Deathwing. And you guys think Deathwing is, is really gone forever? We still have Rathian in play as well as a Black Dragon, and we already are getting hints that there's going to be dragon-related stuff coming up in Battle for Azeroth. By the way, Sargeras, while he may be a demon, he is pretty aesthetically draconic. He, he's not actually as demonic as one would think, uh, nor do I think Sargeras is in any way corrupted. So what people are probably going to draw from this is, oh, well, if the Eye of Nazoth was in Sargeras' blade, Sargeras is corrupted by Nazoth. No, what I'm saying, <laughs> and this is what people are not going to like, is that I think Nazoth is not just some old god. If Nazoth is an old god, it is part of something else if Nazoth even actually is an old god. What I am here to propose to you today is the potential that Nazoth is not necessarily an old god directly at all, and I think that it is possible that Nazoth is a part of Argus the Unmaker, the Titan of Death. And I think that part of the reason why you get little sound bits like deals I like deals. You guys ever heard of like dealing, making a deal with death? Sylvanas has done it. Oh, death really does like deals because death always gets its due. You don't get to cheat it. So making deals with death always works in death's favor. And Nazoth wanting to cause chaos and strife and destruction, wanting the world to break apart and have the world be unmade. Having the Twilight's Hammer cultists at the end of dungeons, like the Stone Core, saying things like, The world shall be reborn in flame. Are you fucking kidding me right now? Are you serious? How about the Emerald Ascension 
a worn pamphlet from the doomsayers that came in Legion that say, Fear not the time when the great Sargeras's shadow blots out the sun, for that is the moment of our ascension. Death will follow, but it is only a doorway. Step through and take on a form kissed by emerald fire. Dig the ash from your eyes and serve a higher purpose at Sargeras's side. Seriously? We have quotes from characters like Gul'dan saying, In the end, death will inherit this world, and she will be waiting. And after Sargeras takes this giant sword, presumably full of death energy, stabs it into the world, thus creating Azerite, which Sylvanas literally says, This will change everything. She was waiting, and she started making her moves. And now we have, like I point out in my last video, Sylvanas intentionally drawing heroes of the both factions back into the fray for this final battle, that which is to come. You want to know the kicker of this whole situation? As I've been trying to point out for over a year and a half now, the Titan Pantheon, I think they, specifically Amenthul and Aenar, are actually the Void Lords. And I think that they are the ones that are responsible for the creation of the old gods in the first place. And I think that they are the ones that Sargeras is afraid of and mad at. And they are the ones that he is trying to stop. Which is actually how it's written in the RPG lore, Shadows and Light. Fittingly named once again. We have small thematic hints like Jaina's very subtle cinematic in the Battle for Azeroth feature overview. Where she has dialogue where she says things like, My father once told me peace is like a dream beautiful, ephemeral, unattainable. I didn't listen. No one listened. We've made kindling from our suffering, stirred the embers of resentment, just waiting for a single spark to set the whole world aflame. A single spark to set the whole world aflame. Hmm. Okay. You mean like uh, this whole storm thing? Like Queen Ashara in the storm, you know, before the storm, a storm that would set the world aflame. We are these seemingly destined champions to pursue this, this whatever the fuck Queen Ashara is making us do right now, to come down and potentially break the chains that keep Nazoth imprisoned. And we hear things like Sylvanas saying to Nathanos, stay focused on the end game. Gul'dan saying things like, let the end game begin. Are you... F Guys, there is no fucking chance, not a, there's no way that there are this many connections between characters like Sargeras and Nazoth in their very clear allegiance. There is no possible way. Am I fucking crazy? Am I crazy? You tell me. I, but I've been seeing this progressing more and more for so long. I promise you something fucking nuts is coming and it's happening very soon. And when... You hear things like, the boy king serves at the master's table, three lies will he offer you. And one of the most profound things Anduin has said this expansion, or at the end of Legion rather, is we did the impossible. We defeated the burning Legion. You see Amenthul beckon Sargeras out of the clouds around Azeroth and say, Brother, your crusade is over. And Sargeras turns, kind of laughs and goes, no, and takes this giant blade which for some reason in the art has this eye, which we can never see, and plunges it into the world. That must be a coincidence too. It just so happens that Ogmot, a Twilight's Hammer cultist, people that wield light and shadow, by the way, literally, literally says to us, that blade has shiny eye, always watching us. Why you no see? We can't see the eye. People have asked me, Pyro, with the gift of Nazoth, do you think that if we went back to Silithus and we hadn't pulled the energy out of that blade, do you think that we would see the eye? Yes, I do. I do think that we would see the eye. Absolutely. I proposed long ago in a, in a long forgotten theory that the old gods could have actually been parts of Argus. This was uh, essentially spurred on by the, this uh, idea based on Greek mythology, about Argos, who was essentially guarding Io, and Zeus, someone who Amenthul is very similar to, 
wanted Io from Argos, so he sent Hermes to basically lull Argos to sleep, the exact thing that is described to an extent from the 1000 Years of War audio drama that talks about Argus, and then bash him over the head with a rock. Then they tore Argos apart and just fucking, just completely fucked him up. So, regardless of where the old gods come from or, or what what have you, I don't think Nazoth is quite the same thing as the other old gods. I think it's very apparent that regardless of what that lying bitch Zalatath says, which she lies about a fucking lot, by the way, her flavor text even says that she's a liar, so we need to stop taking her quotes at face value. Please, God, belly alert, stop taking her quotes at face value. I love your videos, but Jesus Christ. <laughs> I really shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> We need to not trust blatant lies from void entities like Zalatath. It's very clear that Nazoth, whether it is by tactical advantage or by physical strength, is clearly not the weakest old god. That is not fucking true. We need to stop believing bullshit like that. Because the truth of the matter is, based on what I've been able to see, Nazoth is the most powerful old god. What the fuck? They, they imprison him at the bottom of the ocean, or at the bottom of potentially the Well of Eternity, as I have suggested, in this massive Titan facility with multiple, far more chains imprisoning him than yogg Saron in the prison of yogg Saron from Ulduar, far more chains imprisoning him than what we saw in the heart of Yasharaj chamber, far more effort was put into imprisoning whatever Nazoth is. And I think that part of the reason why people like uh, Muffinus in his interview with the wonderful Talies and Nebatel describes in one word characters like Ashara with fire is because Nazoth is in some way, I believe, inherently linked to fire. I know that this is, it's, it's, it's so much that's being drawn together in this relatively all things considered short video, but you have to, you gotta like, give me some, some leeway on this. Like, you gotta see what I'm seeing here. These themes between death and how death is a doorway and it's not the end and that these great truths of the truth of shadow will be revealed to us and, and we're the breaker of chains. What, what does that mean? We come and kill things so we break their chains, the, the tether to a mortal life? Like, what the fuck do these things mean? And how come, how come no one's looking at this? No one's looking at this. <laughs> And, and a lot of these things are, are things that I've been saying for a very long time. So, to put it all together, in short form, yes, Sargeras was working with Nazoth. And I think that regardless of whether Ashara is still obedient to Nazoth or Sargeras or whatever the case is, I think that Nazoth is still, in some capacity, in allegiance with Sargeras. And I think that something is coming that Sargeras knows about and that Nazoth knows about that we can't get through without people like Sylvanas leading us down a path of war and chaos, just like both Nazoth and Sargeras would want her to do, literally taking us down this path to find Ashara and to find Najatar and to find the Eternal Palace to complete the circle, whatever the fuck that means. Let's talk about that real quick. What about Nazoth's dialogue where, he, where we have things being said like, step into the abyss, complete the circle. Sargeras has literally said things like the circle nears completion, the ritual nears completion. Nazoth has dialogue that is saying almost the exact same shit. Is that a coincidence too? Am I actually fucking crazy? Or am I the only guy that somehow managed to notice this shit? Because something is very rapidly approaching and given what I believe is the... Tr the truth about the Pantheon. The Pantheon believes our flesh is a curse. It is something not fit for their worlds that they shape. They would rather have their worlds, as far as we are aware, and according to things like Chronicle, outfitted with creatures of teeming life and things like that, and made of stone and, and, and rock. It, flesh was a curse. The free will that we were granted by the gift of he who is our true creator, which, by the way, I think flesh, the curse of flesh, I think does come from Argus as the curse of mortality, something given probably only by death himself, something that Nazoth seems to be pretty interested in. But I digress. We have these titans who don't want flesh to be a thing. Mortal beings were not in their agenda. And now the only titan who is basically willing to use death to try to fix the problems that exist in the universe, so Thanos-esque, uh, is now imprisoned 
by those who are our greatest fucking threat. I hate to say it, dudes, but if Sargeras... I think that if Sargeras really wanted to, he could have decimated this fucking planet long ago, but that was not in the plan because whatever is housed at the core of this planet, I think may be very important to Sargeras and is something that perhaps through death needs to be reborn. I, I, I don't... I, I still, I can't nail down exactly the grand theory for Sargeras, but the entire premise is that in some capacity, death was removed from the cosmos and Sargeras rebuilt death, used this burning fucking legion to try to fix the problems that were caused by the Pantheon, if albeit a little bit extreme, right? A necessary uh, ordeal in order to save everyone in the grand scheme of things from inevitable consumption of the void which I believe, if the Titans were allowed to have their way, would inevitably happen. I also want to point out while I'm on this topic that I don't think that all the Titans are inherently evil. I think a &R the Lifebinder is about as neutral evil as it gets in D&D terms, and that's probably one of the worst things to be because she doesn't give a fuck about anybody else. It's all about her goals and what she wants. And I have plenty of videos that can supply a ton of more context for what I'm saying to you right now. I'll have links to several of those in the description down below. But I think that ANR life, how fitting, has basically commandeered the control of the pantheon of gods, including time himself, from which I believe the holy light and void stem as potential components of the force of time, entropy and stasis. I've literally seen Naru use light spells to lock orcs into an infinite time stasis, and it's called the blessing of eternity. What the fuck? You guys want to know the scariest thing? If the void eats everything, living things still exist in the void. They don't die. You know what's even scarier? Based on my observations, time doesn't even hardly move in the void. Imagine what it would be like to have your soul sucked into a realm where time barely progresses and you're stuck in a state, if it progresses at all, of infinite entropy that you could never get out of. The Titans are pretty good at building prisons. The Elementals, the Old Gods, the Demons, you fucking name it. But they've also built the perfect prison, and it is the Void. Because once you're in it, you don't get to come back out of it. And whoever has control, whoever gets to lay the law of the universe, so to speak, <coughs> ANR, gets to decide who goes in the Void and who does not. And the perfect beauty, the terrifying truth of it all, is that when she puts you in the Void, you are not going to die. Ever. Doesn't that sound like a lot of fun? So what needs to happen is the destruction of this world so that she, which lays at its core, if she's really in there somewhere, Azeroth, can get out. Because she's not meant to be sleeping inside this planet, if you ask me, just the same way that Argus was not meant to be sleeping inside of his. Light and shadow, as the cursed lovers from Ashara's fight, are drawn together, and when they meet, calamity. But that would be the end of this video. This is something I wanted to tell you guys for a very, very long time, and in fact, I have made a very valiant effort to do so in the past. However, I am apparently crazy and don't know the lore right. Anyway, I appreciate you guys very much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please do hit that like button as it is the best way to support me as a content creator. I love to know if you guys enjoy, so that's how you let me know. Please do subscribe if you enjoyed this video as I look forward to sharing more with you in the coming days. And if you guys aren't aware, I'm like 50 followers away from 15k followers on Twitch. So if you guys wouldn't mind, there's a link to my Twitch down in the description below. And I stream over there every once in a while, uh, trying to be more consistent with it. So I'd really appreciate if you guys would go and check that out too. But with all that being said, I appreciate you guys very much. Stay awesome. And until next time, I'll see you guys later. Peace.